Uh, welcome to day two of our annual Rocky Mountain Infection meeting. We had a beautiful day one with some truly lovely talks and I think some great mathematical fellowship. Uh, and day two promises some more fireworks. Uh, to get things started today, it is my privilege to introduce our second plenary speaker, Dr. Jose Perea. Dr. Perea is originally from Cali, Colombia. He completed a bachelor's degree in mathematics at Universidad del Valle and went on to complete a PhD in math at Stanford University. Uh, he's currently an associate professor at Northeastern University in the Department of Mathematics and the Query College of Computer Sciences. Dr. Perea's work has been supported by grants from DARPA, the National Science Foundation, and the Center for Business and Social Analytics, among others. Uh, and in 2020, he won an NSF Career Award. He's also a 2018 honoree of Mathematically Gifted and Black and a 2020 honoree of Latinxes and Hispanics in the Mathematical Sciences, among many other accomplishments. Uh, he serves the mathematical community by organizing and speaking at uh, numerous conferences, by advising and mentoring undergraduate and graduate students, uh, as well as postdoctoral mentees, uh, by serving on panels and as a referee for numerous journals, uh, by teaching courses and through his research program. Dr. Perea has a wide range of mathematical research interests, including machine learning, computer vision, string series analysis, and also topological data analysis, which I believe relates to his topic for today, as the title of his talk is The Underlying Topology of Data. Rocky Mountain section, please join me in welcoming the inaugural lecturer for the MAA and NAM National Association of Mathematicians, Dr. Jose Perea. Thanks, Dan. Um, let's see. Um, so what, uh, let me start with um, sort of with an image here. Okay, great. So, um, so this uh, picture is from, from Konigsberg. So Konigsberg uh, is a Russian city, uh, and this is what it looked like in the, in the 1700s. And um, the way the, the city was, was built or, or set up, um, it was sort of uh, along the river Pregel, um, and it had sort of the two banks of the river, and then uh, sort of an island in the middle. Uh, and then the, uh, the two uh, banks uh, were connected to the uh, island in the center via seven bridges that sort of were uh, all around the, the, the town. So for example, here you have one bridge, another bridge, another bridge, another bridge. And then what the uh, inhabitants of, of Konigsberg would ask is, um, is it possible to walk around the entire town? So like a, you know, like a Saturday morning walk uh, in such a way that you would traverse every single bridge exactly once. Okay, so, so that was a problem. And uh, Euler, uh, Leonard Euler, one of the great uh, mathematicians of, of all times, uh, who had sort of all his, his, his math fingers in every, in every pie. Um, so this is what he had to say about the, the, the problem of the bridges of, of Konigsberg. So he says, this question is so banal, but seemed to me worthy of attention in that neither geometry nor algebra, nor even the art of counting was sufficient to solve it. Um, so this is a, sort of an interesting uh, statement, right? So Euler is saying, uh, you know, the, the problem itself is not, you know, like earth shattering. Um, but what is, what is weird is that the math we have doesn't seem to have the right tools to attack it, right? So um, Euler is of the generation after Newton, and, uh, you know, with Newton, we got, you know, calculus, for example. So if you wanted to know something like the rate of change of, of some quantity, uh, for example, with respect to time, uh, like velocity. So what you had to do, you had to take the, 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 let's say, the function velocity and take its derivative, right? So the mathematical object was the, the function and the process was take the derivative, right? And that would give you the answer. But for this problem, it was sort of not clear what to do, right? Like, what is the mathematical object? What do we do to it to get the answer, okay? So, so Euler starts to, you know, to think about this and he goes, you know what, uh, the size of the land masses, sort of how big the sort of the river banks and how big the, the islands are is not super important. So let's just replace them by, by dots, by, by these, the, these big blue dots. 
Um, okay, uh, step two, uh, the size of the bridges, you know, how long they are, uh, whether or not they curve, is, is not super important either. So let's just replace them by, by lines, right, uh, edges. Um, so now we have a, a graph. And uh, for us now, you know, we have a, a graph. It doesn't seem like something, you know, again, super earth shattering, but, but you have to realize that in Euler's time, graphs were not a thing. He was actually the one that invented graph theory with this, with this uh, approach. Um, so, so, okay, great. So he takes a graph and he says, what can I compute about it that doesn't depend on the length of the edges or the sides of the nodes? Um, so one thing you could compute is the degree, right? So the degree of a node is how many edges go into it. So for example, this, this node up here has uh, one, two, three edges. So three, five, three, and three, okay? So uh, degree, that's one thing you can compute about a graph. And this is what Euler proves, just a beautiful theorem. So he, he says, if a graph G has an Eulerian path, he, of course he didn't call it Eulerian, that's what we call it today, uh, but an Eulerian path is again a walk across a graph that uh, traverses each edge uh, exactly once. So what Euler proves is that if the graph has an Eulerian path, then the number of nodes that have odd degree uh, better be either zero or two. Okay, so again, beautiful theorem, and, and he, he then looks at the special case that motivated everything, the, 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 the city of Konigsberg, and he looks at the, uh, the nodes and their degrees, and he says, oh, you know, there's a bunch of nodes that have odd degree, so no, there is no Olerian path, right? So um, this, uh, at least to me, is a great example of um, a problem, you know, an applied problem, you know, can you take a walk? Uh, along uh, Konigsberg that uh, sort of pushes the limits of mathematics, right? It tells you that you need to invent new math uh, to solve that practical problem. And, you know, you can, of course, solve the particular problem, but then the math you invented opens up all, all sorts of, of new avenues of research. Um, so that is some of, of, of what I do uh, nowadays, perhaps not at the, the scale of Euler, of course, but, but at least in the same spirit. Okay, so these same ideas of, you know, forget about the, the, the size of nodes and size of edges, it's also what, what, what topology is all about. Okay, so uh, in, in topology, which is again a branch of, of, of modern mathematics, um, we, we think about objects, uh, but we don't care about deforming them, just like Euler didn't uh, care. Um, so the, the joke is that a topologist cannot distinguish between a coffee mug and a donut because you can go from one to the other via continuous deformations, okay? And uh, what uh, topological data analysis is, um, is essentially taking the same approach that Euler took, you know, take problems that uh, do not depend so much on, on specific size, but on shape, uh, and try to use them to solve interesting things. So, um, so hopefully, I'm going to be able to show you some of this uh, sort of the application areas that we can treat with the same principles uh, that that Euler developed. Um, so, let's start uh, easy. What are, what are some things that topologists compute? Um, so, here are two spaces. Uh, on the left, you have uh, a two-dimensional sphere. Uh, on the left, the, the sphere. On the right, the torus. So, the torus is the surface of of the donut. Um, so uh, one of the things topologists compute about shapes uh, is the Betty numbers, okay? So um, uh, the Betty number N of, uh, of, a, of a space um, is more or less the number of all holes that the uh, space has in dimension N, okay? So for each integer N, you get one of these Betty numbers. And I'm gonna try to illustrate what this means in a moment. But again, the whole point is that we're trying to compute things uh, that do not change if you sort of deform your space a little bit. Um, so what is Betty zero? Um, Betty zero uh, turns out to be the number of connected components that your space has. Uh, so holes in, holes in dimension zero. Um, so for example, the sphere is a connected piece. So it has one connected component. Uh, and then the torus is also just one connected piece and therefore has one connected component. Okay, cool. Betty zero counts a number of connected components. Um, Betty one 
on the other hand, um, count the number of uh, one-dimensional holes. Um, so what are one-dimensional holes? So, so what you do is you draw uh, closed uh, curves uh, on your space, and you ask if that curve uh, bounds an empty region, okay? So on the sphere, every time you draw a closed curve on the surface of it, uh, there's always a two-dimensional spherical cap that is filling in uh, the interior of that closed loop. That's why Betty one of the sphere is zero. The, it doesn't have one-dimensional holes. Um, the torus, on the other hand, um, has sort of these sort of two uh, sort of different holes in the sense that if you look at the blue curve, uh, it bounds sort of this empty region um, going sort of vertically, and then the red curve uh, bounds also an empty region because the, the torus is sort of hollow in the middle. So that's why Betty one of the torus is uh, two. Um, and then finally, um, Betty two um, of the sphere, or sort of Betty two counts the number of voids, right? So um, what, it, what it's asking is uh, what are sort of closed uh, to dimensional surfaces bounding a three-dimensional empty uh, space. Uh, so again, the sphere itself is a two-dimensional object that is bounding an empty uh, three-dimensional void uh, in the middle. So that's why Betty 2 of the sphere is one. And uh, similarly, the torus is itself a two-dimensional object that is bounding a three-dimensional void um, in the middle. Uh, that's why Betty 2 of the torus is one. So um, that's sort of the, the, the intuition of the Betty numbers. And hopefully you can see that it's similar in spirit to the idea of the degree that uh, Euler uh, computed. Um, so let me now sort of transition to uh, what this has to do with data, okay? So now imagine that you have a, a data set. So typically what a data set is, is a collection of points. And not only do you have points, but you have a way of measuring distances between pairs of points. Um, so for example, here you have a bunch of uh, data points, the, the black dots, and they are arranged in sort of a circular pattern. At least that's what humans uh, interpret when we look at this uh, collection of points. And the question is, what can we compute about this data set that would tell us that it has the shape of a circle? Right? So we just learned about the, the Betty numbers. So you would be tempted to compute uh, you know, Betty numbers for, for, for this collection of, of points. Um, but it turns out that you know, Betty zero, which again counts the number of connected components, it's gonna be essentially the number of data points, right? Because all the points are disconnected from each other. Um, and then if you, if you look at Betty one, um, which again is supposed to count uh, sort of these one dimensional holes, then you would get zero, right? Because the, the, the points are completely disconnected. There's no way to trace a closed loop uh, sort of around the, the, the along the data points. Um, okay, so that's uh, sort of dissatisfying a little bit, but but here's something one can do, which is which is sort of the natural generalization. So something you could do is to uh, draw edges and connect points that are nearby. Okay, uh, and what we're going to do is that if we have connected uh, three data points, we're going to fill in. The, the triangle, and if we have connected four data points, we're going to fill in the tetrahedron, and so on uh, in higher dimensions. And we're going to uh, sort of increase slowly how far out we're connecting uh, our data points, right? So we start by connecting things that are only very, very close to each other, and then we allow the scale of connections to increase, and we connect things that are farther and farther away. And what you could see is that at some point, um, sort of the circularity of the data is now captured in this triangulated space. And this is something for which we can now compute Betty numbers and hopefully will give us the, the, the right answer, okay? So that's the, that's the plan, that's the, the, the strategy we're gonna use. And, 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 and my hope is that I can show you some uh, useful applications of, of this idea. Um, so again, just to, to recap, um, we start with a data set on the left and we want to compute uh, topological things about it. Um, and again, just for the data set, it's going to be essentially trivial, things like the Betty numbers. So what we do is we build this sequence 
of uh, triangulated spaces by looking at the data at increasing uh, distance scales. Okay, uh, what we do next is we compute uh, the Betty numbers, uh, which again, uh, for each uh, N, give you a count of the number of holes that the space has uh, in dimension N. Um, so for example, um, you know, we could compute, you know, Betty N and, and maybe, uh, you know, for K zero, you're gonna get uh, Betty N equals three. And I'm gonna denote that by three dots. Maybe for K one, Betty N is four. So you get, I'm gonna represent that by four dots and so on. We're gonna keep track of, 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 the, of the number we're getting for each one of the Betty numbers. Okay, cool. Um, but not only do we have sort of a bunch of these triangulated spaces, um, they are connected to each other, right? So they, they are sort of these increasing sequence of spaces uh, that you're constructing by adding more and more connections. So that means that we can actually track how the Betty numbers correspond from one triangulation to the next. Um, and we're gonna do that as follows. We're gonna just draw uh, horizontal lines to say, you know, this hole corresponds to this hole later on. And in and, and that process of tracking holes across dimensions um, gives you something that is called the barcode, right? right? It's supposed to be a signature of, of how the Betty numbers change across, across scale. And, and the idea is that the longer the line, uh, is mean is, is, is what is meant to, to convey is that the hole is persisting uh, across uh, a longer a, long, a longer uh, sort of range of scales. Okay, so that's the that's the recipe. This is like the, the most important slide of the of the presentation. Um, so so here is a, again a, a real example um, uh, on the uh, on the on the top right we have uh, the torrents which again is the surface of the donut. And we have uh, its Betty numbers, as we said before, Betty zero counts the number of connected components, Betty one counts the number of uh, loops that bound empty regions, uh, and Betty two counts the number of uh, closed surface that bound uh, three-dimensional voids, okay? And uh, I did the following experiment. I sampled um, uh, points at random from uh, the surface and I got the collection of points on the lower left. Um, and then I did essentially what I, what I described earlier, right? Computed the sequence of triangulated spaces and then tracked how the Betty numbers uh, changed across scale. And these are the barcodes uh, we get uh, in, in this process. Um, and again, what I want you to notice is that you get in the barcode for dimension zero, you get one long bar. Um, in the barcode for dimension one, you get uh, two long bars. In the barcode for dimension two, you get one long bar. In that, the long bars in each dimension uh, sort of correspond to the count of, of Betty numbers we had uh, for the original space, okay? So this is how, you know, we in TDA and topological data analysis uh, take data sets uh, compute things like barcodes about them and use those barcodes to reason about what is the underlying topology uh, of the data, okay? And this is what uh, we know in the, in, the, in the field as the persistent homology of data. Um, so I think that there are some uh, comments in the, uh, in the chat. Okay, great. Um, so that's the, that's the story. Um, data sets, multi-scale representations with triangulated spaces, track Betty numbers, uh, and draw these barcodes. So here's a, perhaps a more realistic data set. Um, it's a collection of, of images of a little uh, ducky in, in sort of several positions. Um, and again, when you look at an image, uh, you can just think of it as a, as a huge matrix, right? Where you have uh, as many entries as pixels you have in your image. And then every uh, entry in the matrix is telling you the pixel intensity as a number between zero and one, for example, okay? And then as a data set, you can just think of it as a bunch of matrices and you can just think of distances between matrices. Um, so this is the, the barcode in dimension zero and dimension one for that data set of little duckies. Um, again, I wanna emphasize that each image is one data point, okay? Um, so you have uh, sort of one long bar in dimension zero, uh, which is telling you that the data is probably connected. 
and you have one long bar in dimension one, which is telling you that the, the data probably has a hole, uh, sort of some sort of loop that is that's not filled in. Okay. Um, so I actually uh, constructed a visualization of the data using sort of methods from uh, machine learning, like dimensionality reduction. And uh, this is actually how the, how the data sits in its ambient space, in Euclidean space. Um, so it turns out that, you know, uh, the data actually lies around a closed curve. Um, and when you go around the, the curve, essentially what the duck is doing is it is turning around. Um, and this is exactly the loop that was captured by the, by the barcodes, right? That it was connected, one loop, and that you had a hole, the one that we're seeing uh, going around, okay? So uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to, to post them in the, in the chat. I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on it. Um, so loops, barcodes, uh, why do we care? Um, so uh, there's a particular uh, class of machine learning problems where you want to when you want to detect recurrent phenomena in, in time varying data, um, sort of it's surprisingly varied what 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 this class of, of, of problems uh, contains. Um, so, for example, uh, here is a um, sort of a collection of, of of different sort of data modalities um, that have recurrent phenomena, the recurrent uh, sort of behavior to them. Uh, so, for example, here in the in the top left. Uh, here's the, the Z-score for, um, sort of for housing prices in the U.S. And, and what you see is that uh, sort of the score has sort of, sort of cyclic uh, behavior. Um, in the lower left, uh, this is a, a gene expression panel uh, associated to the cell cycle uh, for um, yeast, I believe. Uh, so what you're seeing is that as the cell goes through through its cycle, the genes are being expressed in in, in repetitive uh, in a repetitive fashion. And then on the on the on the right, uh, sort of the picture is supposed to evoke this idea that uh, biological organisms like humans, uh, we have a lot of sort of recurrent uh, clocks. You're right, like the circadian clock. Uh, the thing that you know we get hungry and, and sleepy more or less at the same time every day. And you have things like cell division and so on that, that behave in, in repetitive uh, patterns. And, and the question, or at least one question, the biologists want to understand is, you know, what are the genes that are controlling these clocks, and how are they related to each other? Okay. So again, the the, the point is that um, there's a lot of problems where detecting recurrent patterns. Is, is a useful thing to do. Um, so the question is then, you know, what is recurrence and, and, and how do we quantify it you know, in a sort of a way that is pretty robust? Um, so here's a, an idea for, for doing that. So imagine that you have a time series here in, in red, right? So a, a sequence of, of values, um, you know, parameterized by time. So the idea of, of sliding windows is actually sort of quite simple. And, and hopefully we'll see how it works. Um, so the idea is, you know, fix a uh, parameter W, which is going to be the size of the window. Um, and then for every T in the domain of your, of your time series, uh, look at the graph of the function between T and T plus W, right? So this gives you sort of a little snippet, a little window of the graph of the, of the time series. Okay, and sliding the window means varying t. Okay, so here are uh, some of the snippets I got from the previous time series, and what I did was to arrange them next to each other by similarity. Right, so the more similar they are, the closer they are uh, together, and the uh, more dissimilar they are, the farther apart uh, you you will be uh, seeing them. And the point is that. If the, if the time series really is recurrent or periodic, then the snippets should be arranged in a, in a circular pattern, okay? And this is what we're gonna detect with topology, the arrangement of, of sort of the circular arrangement of these snippets. Um, so again, to put uh, some, some uh, math to, to, the, to the intuition, um, uh, you know, imagine that you have a, a, a time series that is the result of sampling some function f, and uh, fix uh, a couple of parameters. Uh, tau, which is, uh, is going to be a positive number, a uh, real number, and D, which is going to be uh, an integer. Um, and what we're going to do is, again, for every T, 
we're going to evaluate uh, the function f or you know, perhaps some cubic spline of the time series at the values uh, t, uh, t plus tau, t plus two tau, all the way up to t plus d tau, okay? So essentially what you're doing is you are uh, using this vector to discretize the window between t and t plus d tau. And again, varying the window is gonna be, uh, uh, sorry, sliding the window is gonna be varying uh, t. And, and again, when you do that, what you're gonna get is a collection of points in Rd plus one, uh, which we call the, the sliding window point cloud. And what we're gonna exploit uh, you know, many, many times is that sort of recurrent properties of the time series are gonna be reflected in sort of circular patterns of the sliding window point cloud. And we're gonna measure that with topology. Um, so just to whet your appetite, uh, here are some time series on the left and the uh, sliding window point clouds that they generate. Um, so it is cool to see that, you know, sort of different uh, recurrent patterns really uh, reconstruct different types of spaces. Uh, so for the people that know dynamical systems, this is sort of very natural, is the sort of time delay embedding and, and, and attractive reconstruction machinery that you're uh, probably familiar with. Um, but again, here we have a periodic function on the top recovering a, a circle for the sliding window point cloud, um, a function that is not periodic, it's called, it's called quasi-periodic, and it fills out a two-dimensional torus, um, and a function that is uh, sort of this uh, trapezoidal uh, sort of pattern, it, it recovers a, a two-dimensional sphere, okay? Um, so uh, to recap, uh, we're gonna use uh, sliding windows and one-dimensional um, uh, barcodes or sort of this uh, persistent scoring to, to measure uh, recurrence. Um, so time series, sliding window point cloud, uh, sequence of triangulated spaces, barcode. That's the recipe. And the idea is that if you see a long bar in the one-dimensional uh, barcode, then that is indicative of recurrence of the, of the time series. Okay. Um, so there's a, uh, okay, cool. The, 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 the first thing we did when, 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 uh, when doing the, the, the when, when starting this pipeline was actually to go to the mathematics, right? To, to try to understand mathematically what each step is doing. Uh, so if you're interested in the mathematics behind this construction, you can go and check uh, that paper out uh, from a, of a few years ago. Um, okay, cool. Once we knew uh, some of the mathematics, we went ahead and implemented it in algorithms. And the first problem we attacked was, was, was sort of this question of, of biological clocks. Uh, how to identify sort of periodic genes in, in, in organisms. Um, and and the, the results of, of that problem are in, in, in this article that you can find online. Um, but what's the story? The, the problem is the following. Uh, you're given a data set of uh, gene expressions. Uh, so what is the, what is the experiment? Um, uh, you take a, a bunch of mice um, and then you synchronize their circadian clocks. Uh, and then every hour you take a mouse, uh, you take a piece of uh, its liver and then do a gene expression panel. Uh, doing that is gonna give you one of these columns in this data set, okay? Now you do that in the next hour that gives you the next column and so on. You do that every hour for some period of time, and that gives you a bunch of time series, right? So each row is gonna be a time series that is telling you how a particular gene is varying with time. And again, the goal is to uh, rank these genes according to repetition, because we want to identify uh, periodic genes. Um, so here are some of the genes we found at the top of, of these uh, rankings using the idea of sliding windows and barcodes as our uh, periodicity detection method. Uh, so we're happy to see that at the top, you, you really see um, sort of genes that, that look very, very repetitive. Um, that then if you look at the bottom of the rankings, uh, the genes do not look as repetitive. They look like, like noisy um, at time series. But the, the cool thing was that if you now compared what topology gave you uh, to what other methods uh, found. So things like, you know, autocorrelation, Fourier analysis, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, what we found was that um, topology was able to find genes 
that when you look at them, they you know, truly look periodic and repetitive, but we're not as highly ranked as repetitive by these other methods. So, so, so you, you would miss them. So, so that was sort of a very encouraging thing to see that so these topological ideas were, were useful in finding uh, new information. Um, so uh, plowing ahead, I'm gonna use a different type of visualization for the next section of the talk. Um, so we've seen these barcodes uh, by now several times. Um, and another way to visualize them is as what is called uh, persistence diagrams. So essentially what you do is you replace every bar in the barcode by a point. And uh, if the barcode starts at, if the bar starts at A and ends at B, you replace it by the point with coordinates A comma B. That's all it is. I'm replacing a barcode by a scatter plot and each point represents, the, represents a bar. Uh, the thing to notice is that the distance from a point to the diagonal is the same as the length of the bar. So uh, points that are farther from the diagonal correspond to bars that are longer, which is, which is the ones you want. Okay, cool. Um, so, so here is um, a, a, a paper I like very, very much. This is for, from, the, from the group of Edgar Lovaton at, at, at NC State. I didn't participate in this paper, um, but this is what they did. Um, they took um, uh, motion capture sensor data. So, so what is that? So, so you take individuals and you put um, sensors in their uh, joints. Um, and then what you do is you record how those sensors are uh, moving, so the gyroscopes, um, as time goes on. So, uh, and the goal is to identify the, the, the action the individual is, is doing by how the sensors look like, okay? By how the time series from the sensors look like. Um, so what they did is they took uh, the sensor data, uh, turned it into point clouds by, by, by doing sort of this sliding window trick, and then used the, the persistence diagrams or the barcodes as, as signatures for the movement. Um, and here are some examples. Uh, so you have, for example, here someone walking, um, and here you have the corresponding um, sort of point clouds and the barcode and then the persistence diagrams, uh, someone waving, bicycling, golfing, and again, the, the different uh, point clouds and the corresponding persistence diagrams. And, and you can see that they look different uh, to, the, to the human eye. And you know, when they used sort of machine learning algorithms, um, what they saw is that you know, the classification accuracy of what movement is it from the persistence diagram was actually quite high. They were very successful in, in, in doing sort of these, um, you know, action classification for motion sensor data and topology. Uh, really, really cool work. Um, more recently, with, with one of my uh, graduate students, former graduate students, uh, Hitesh Gakar, um, we started sort of to get more serious into sort of different types of recurrence, right? So we've seen periodicity appear already and periodicity giving you circles which we use to analyze genes. Um, but again, you have other types of, of recurrence. So for example, here you have um, cosine of t plus cosine of 3t. That is a periodic function. You know, we all know that it's very repetitive. Uh, but then cosine of t plus cosine of pi t is actually not periodic, right? So this function does not repeat exactly, but it does have a, uh, a, a recurrent uh, flavor to it. Uh, this is what is called a quasi-periodic function. Okay, um, so again, when we do the sliding windows construction to the first uh, example, we get a circle. Uh, again, we already knew that. Um, but the cool thing is that when you do it to um, a quasi-periodic function, you get something that looks like a torus. And, and again, the dimension of the torus is gonna be given by the number of uh, frequencies in your, in your time series. Uh, the difference between the first and the second example is that the frequencies of f are related via rational numbers, meaning they are commensurate, but then the frequencies in the second example are related via irrational numbers, right? So they are non-commensurate. Um, so it is cool to see that the, that the frequency content is translated to different topological signatures for these uh, sliding window point clouds. And again, it is something that we can detect uh, quite strongly with uh, things like persistence diagrams and, and barcodes, which are the same thing. So we took this uh, idea and again, ran with it. Um, and, and, you know, in, in the following set of experiments, um, 
So if you, if you think of a video, right? A video is nothing but a sequence of images, of frames. Uh, so you can think of it as a time series, a time series of images. And just like we did before, when we did sliding windows of numbers, we can also do sliding windows of image frames and, and apply the same machinery we've, we've applied uh, all along. So for example, for this video, uh, the sliding window point cloud looks something like this. It looks like a, like a circle because the video is very repetitive, okay? So um, we went uh, online and collected a ton of, uh, of video data. Uh, you know, some videos have uh, very repetitive, re repetitive patterns and some of the other videos uh, do not, okay? Um, so what did we do with, this, with these videos? Um, so we went online and, and, and used uh, this sort of cool service uh, called uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Uh, so what it is, is you pay humans uh, to do simple classification tasks, okay? So this is what our um, sort of participants were presented with. They were presented with pairs of videos, uh, just like what you're seeing now, and we would ask them, what video seems more repetitive to you, okay? Uh, so... Um, humans are, again, very good at perceptual tasks. So uh, whatever algorithms you develop, uh, it is good to test them against what humans uh, are, are, are saying, okay? So we took all the comparisons from humans and generated a periodicity ranking for all the videos we collected, okay? And then compared that ranking to, you know, several machine learning uh, models. And, and this is what we found. Um, so when we compare the sort of the rankings of, um, of humans to the rankings given by sort of sliding windows, so topology, uh, and we compare what humans see to other methods like Clutter Davies frequency or, 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 or lattice, uh, what we found is that topology was more highly correlated with humans than other methods uh, were which again is, is encouraging, it's telling us that we are finding uh, things that are sort of strongly correlated to the best uh, sort of perceptual classifiers. Um, so here's a, another example for the audience and, and, and you can uh, sort of participate uh, live if you so desire. So, so here's a, of course, a time series, a video. Um, and the question I have for the audience is, is, is the video uh, periodic or quasi-periodic? What I'm asking is, do the dots um, sort of vibrate at frequencies that link up at some point or, or they never link up, right? Like th th there's no repetition ever. Um, so if you wanna participate, uh, so just write in the chat, P for periodic, Q for quasi-periodic. So, and and I'll, keep, I'll keep a tally of what I see. So, so I see P, I see Q, right? So, so, so again, P is sort of perfect repetition uh, and Q is uh, sort of that they never actually link up. Um, so I see a bunch of, of Qs. Okay, cool. So again, it's, it's actually hard <laughs> to see. I don't know how the, how the people that, that said Q figured that out, but it, it, it turns out to be the case. We, we designed this experiment to be quasi-periodic and then when you compute the, the sliding windows uh, embeddings or the sliding window point clouds, you do get the two-dimensional torus we were expecting because of the non-commensurate frequencies. And that is something that we sort of very clearly captured in the, in the persistence diagrams on the other end, okay? So it's the point of, you know, sometimes the visual task is actually hard, and, but, the, but the, the mathematics is just an, an easy way to get the, the right answer. So, so we took these sort of lessons we learned of you know, periodicity in videos, quasi-periodicity in videos, and we attacked the, the following problem. Uh, so these are videos from the speech sciences lab at, at Michigan State. Um, and what they have is a bunch of high-speed videos of vocal folds opening and closing. And what they want to, to know is what are the dynamics of, of voice? Like what are the muscular uh, defects or effects that are, that are happening? Um, so this is someone normal uh, saying, ah, and as they do that, the vocal folds are vibrating. Um, 
And this is what the sliding windows point cloud of a normal person looks like. It looks like a circle and what the persistence diagrams look like for that point cloud, okay? So normal equals circle capturing the persistence diagram. Um, but there are other pathologies like um, sort of this clinical asymmetry where the vocal folds are vibrating at clashing frequencies. Um, and we see that actually very clearly in the, in the uh, sliding window point clouds. They look like tori. And again, when we uh, look at the persistence diagrams, we do see the two one-dimensional classes in red and then the two-dimensional class in, in green, telling us that in fact, we do have a torus, okay? So this is an automatic way of detecting sort of these different modalities um, of vibration in the vocal folds from, from video data. Uh, so we, we went ahead, you know, and, and took sort of a larger database of these videos and were able to, to sort of uh, perform automatic classification of these different pathologies. Um, so um, we've come a long way, right? So we started with, with Euler and the idea of, um, you know, attacking practical problems with what is now topological ideas. Um, and I've shown you several constructions in applications to, to, to sort of several domains like biology, motion capture detection, um, you know, uh, voice uh, sciences. Um, so for the next uh, sort of five minutes of the talk, I wanna leave you with, with sort of a mathematical question slash framework, uh, which is the following. Um, a lot of the applications we've seen uh, take the form, you know, compute persistence diagrams, you know, maybe from, from videos of vocal folds or from gene expression data, and then use those persistence diagrams to make predictions. Is it periodic? Is it quasi-periodic? Um, so I think it is worth studying the mathematics of, of this process of, you know, capturing shape with persistence diagrams and then building classifiers uh, to predict um, quantities of interest. Um, let me give you an example of how that works in practice and a theorem of some of the things we've been doing lately, okay? So the application is to, um, so, uh, pr so to protein function classification. Um, and there's this very cool data set that, that everybody can, can go and look at, the, the protein classification benchmark collection. Um, so a protein, you can think of it as a collection of, of points in R3, uh, just the, the, the locations of the atoms, if you will. Um, and for that point cloud, uh, the, the, the point is that the function of the protein is highly correlated to the way the, the shape of, of the protein uh, is presented, you know, to the configuration of points in R3. So what we're going to do is we're going to represent each protein um, by its uh, persistence diagram, correct? We're going to compute these descriptor of shapes of, of these molecules, which are invariant to things like rotations, translations, and so on. And again, the question is, what is the mathematics of making predictions with these um, persistence diagrams? Um, so in a, in a recent paper that is gonna be published uh, hopefully soon, um, uh, we tackled that problem, the problem of how do we learn classifiers in the space of persistence diagrams with, with some guarantees? Um, so just to give you a flavor of how that, of what the theory looks like. Um, Again, if you have a persistence diagram, it's just going to be a bunch of uh, points, like the, like the ones I'm showing you here on the left. Um, if, you, if you fix a continuous function f um, from w, so w is the wedge, the, the triangular region where the, where the points of the persistence diagram are located. So if you take a, a function f that has compact support in this region, um, then uh, the following observation is, uh, is sort of true, is that the function that takes a persistence diagram, DGM, and it sends it to the number uh, that you obtain by evaluating F at each red point, and then adding up all the values, this process gives you a continuous function from the space of persistence diagrams to the real numbers, okay? And then the main theorem we were able to prove is that if you have a compact subset of the space of persistence diagrams and some underlying function f, you want to approximate like a classifier, the one that is telling you this is a, a periodic persistence diagram, 
Um, then given any scale epsilon, we can find some of those uh, compactly supported functions in such a way that you can approximate essentially the classifier as closely as you want it, okay? And we've spent uh, some time developing algorithms to realize these, these types of, of theorems. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip just a couple of slides, but I'll tell you the punchline. So the punchline is, uh, here's this protein classification problem where we have something like 1300 proteins and each protein has something like a thousand atoms. And what we wanna do is we wanna run around 55 classification tasks, okay? And those tasks are related to, again, the functions of the proteins. Um, and what we went ahead and did is we took uh, our proteins, computed persistence diagrams, and then used the, the machinery we developed uh, in, in the theoretical side to, 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 to run those classification problems. And, and we got sort of classification accuracies in the sort of 98% uh, realm, which is telling us that the topological signature is actually very, very strong, and that the theorems we proved for approximating these classifiers are actually um, working in practice. So uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that this sort of piqued your, your, your curiosity and, and hopefully you will have the, the interest to, to learn some more, more topology. Um, thank you very much.